Morning. Well, welcome everybody uh, to to Toronto. I want to talk uh, a little bit about the the partnership between our fundamental drive to explore and how the technology both enables it and accelerates it. But I thought first I just want to welcome everybody to the north. Um, We got, we got an important couple of days here together uh, at the Super Session, but uh, there's a, a small group of people from this city that have a couple important days getting ready for tomorrow night as well. Um, been a really interesting thing to watch. Very unifying for the country, but having a lot of fun. Uh, so, uh, Anusha, that was great, and, and thanks for all of the, the inspirational thoughts and, and where it leads us. Um, we have uh, had a pretty good look at this so far. Been all around the planet, um, been using the best of our technology to try and explore it and understand it. We've even been able to, to lean up next to the window uh, and, uh, and squeeze the, the plunger and take a picture like this one of where we live. But I just wanted to go quickly maybe looking at the role of technology in how we've gotten to where we are and, and why we do it. You know, what do, we, what do we even do CDL for? For me, fundamentally, it is to improve the quality of life. I think that's why we're doing this, to, to lead a better life. I think that's why each one of those predecessors to us um, pursued things since they were little. How do they modify their local environment using the best of the ideas that they've been passed on or they could come up with to try and improve the quality of their own life, and if they got a little bit left over, improve the quality of the lives around them? And it's so much been driven by our ability to go explore. And if you look at, for 300,000 years of us, we've sort of been limited to about six kilometers an hour. It's about how fast we could go. Uh, if you hustle, you know, and, uh, and get the right uh, Lululemon gear, you can go maybe, what, about uh, 11 kilometers an hour or something. And if you are the best ever in 300,000 years of Homo sapiens, you can get up to, the record right now is 44 and a half kilometers an hour, if you're like being chased by a saber-toothed tiger or something, you can get to that sort of speed. But that has been our speed limit basically for 300,000 years, under 50 kilometers an hour. It's as fast as we could go. But even with just that, and primarily at six kilometers an hour, we've gone everywhere the red arrows are. It just occasionally had to build rafts. But otherwise, we managed to go, oh, those are the years since we left Africa. Um, and I was just down in Australia walking around Ayers Rock, where we've been living for 70,000 years, I think. But just using uh, our own ability to walk, we've gone this far. But we had to invent a lot of stuff to live in these red arrows. We had to harness fire. We had to understand navigation. We had to be able to process and carry food with us, so all of the food preparation. Uh, we had to be able to build clothing, which is a complex a series of technical advancements, and we had to be able to build shelter. And so a lot of the stuff that the city stream is looking at, we had to be looking at just to be able to do this on foot. But some clever um, CDL applicants about 6,000 years ago said, hey, I got a better idea. We can go faster than Usain Bolt if we can jump on one of those wild horses. And that was a pretty crazy person who first leapt on one of these animals up on the, whatever, in Kazakhstan, steps somewhere. But suddenly we were faster than Bolt. And then there were these young CDL supplicants in, um, in the Ukraine 6,000 years ago, and they took the best of the technology that existed. And they needed metals. We could not build the wheel until our, our copper age or bronze age had gotten good enough that we could have sharp enough metals that we could take the right size tree and cut it the right way. And the hard part was the axle, of course. How can you make the axle go through the hole and support the vehicle that will lend you, allow you to ride? But with, with that leapfrog of metallurgy and the growing importance of agriculture and then the restless inventiveness of those young uh, folks in the Ukraine, we invented the wheel. Seems like once in history, about 6,000 years ago. And it required a lot of uh, synergistic technologies. But with that, we were away. And then there were some great ideas brought to the super sessions back then, although this one wasn't, wasn't all that hot. Um, this one did not get funded when they stood up in front of everybody. Um, <laughs> But we've been accelerating ever since. And 
um, I like, th this is a great uh, visualization of what the satellites show us for how the air currents move around the world. I love watching how the Sahara feeds um, the Amazon and, uh, and all of the Caribbean. But also, if you look up by Norway, you can see the winds ebb and flow west to east and east to west. And the, the young inventors up there a thousand years ago recognized that, and they built a ship that was a combination of uh, mechanically powered and wind powered so that they could take advantage of the environment and the human uh, input. And with this long ship, it was nowhere near as fast as, as a horse and buggy, but it allowed a level of exploration that was unprecedented at the time. The, the Vikings, they, they helped set up what became Russia. They traded all across the Mediterranean. They discovered Iceland. They settled in Greenland for a couple hundred years. They even were the first Europeans to, to make it to Canada about the year 1000. That combination of technology and the restless urge to get a better quality of life um, pushed that such, such that there's Viking in almost everybody who is descended from, from European families. And then an invention came, and this, I don't know, he, I don't think there's anybody in the room who looks exactly like Johannes here, but he had a great idea. He took an old Chinese technology, um, and he managed to put it into a machine in about 1440, um, the printing press. And when Johannes Gutenberg, uh, maybe Doug Sinclair would look a little bit like Johannes there, I think. Um, apologies, Doug. Uh, but... Uh, yeah. He put this thing together in 1440, and it was the internet. By 1500, they had printed 20 million volumes. Talk about democratization of information. Suddenly, the whole age of discovery was off to the races because people had access to ideas that we sort of take for granted. But it was Gutenberg set that up. And someone who really benefited from it um, lived here in, uh, in Portugal. And... Uh, this, to me, this was the ultimate sort of super session that uh, this guy put together. And look at him. He was so cool. He was like wearing a T-shirt under his uh, collarless jacket back then. That's Henry. That's the only actual likeness we have of Henry the Navigator. But Henry, bit, he's sort of like a Jay Agrawal kind of guy. He said, you know, um, we now maybe in history can bring all these ideas together. Let's bring the best most aggressively intellectual and restless people we have. Let's put all those ideas together and see what we can come up with to try and push back the edge of what's possible with technology. And they came up with the spaceship of the day, which they called the Caravelle, which could beat the wind like no ship had ever done before, and it could go into shallow waters. The great spaceship of discovery that opened up uh, not just all sailing around Portugal, but in 1487, when uh, Bartolomeu Diaz made it around Africa for the first time, suddenly you could get to a whole new part of the world, and just uh, six years later or so, uh, Columbus said, hey, it's round, let's go the other way. And, um, and, and suddenly the whole world was open in a way it had never been before. And, and we're away to the races. And one of the things that that group of young inventors really perfected was the instruments of navigation. Um, that the Apollo 13 crew posed with here. There's a sextant and an astrolabe. And uh, the astrolabe is really important. Just, just a couple years ago, off the coast of Oman, uh, some divers found this. This is an astrolabe from 1502. And it was from a Vasco da Gama's uh, ship. Uh, one of them wrecked there in a big storm off the coast of Oman. And uh, if that's that astrolabe on the left. But when you look at what they were like on the right, they were the, uh, the smartphone absolutely of the day. All the collected navigational information, it's all printed on it. You can navigate, keep track of time, predict future events. Tremendously useful tool. Th that identification of technology to allow us to then more reliably go explore and do things we've never been have a chance to do before. Um, but we also went into the third dimension, not too much long after that. Talk about a restless, energetic young mind. These guys, they came from a printing family. Joseph on the left, that's a real cleaned up photo. But he was, uh, he was one of the real crazy young people. Uh, he was like the one that would grab a handkerchief and jump off the house to see if he could float to the ground. But he was sitting, his brother was, uh, Etienne was a much better business person. He was like the one here at the Rotman School. And um, Joseph, though, was sitting looking at the fire. 
and he watched the sparks fly. And he was like, how come the sparks are flying? They weigh more than air. How come they're flying? And he built a little model and stuck it over the fire, and this box floated up into the air. He went, wow, maybe we could build a big enough box and fly. And he managed to convince his, his uh, more conservative brother. And in 1783, they, in Paris, they had this great big show. There were all sorts of influential politicians there and business people, a couple of future U.S. presidents. They were all there. They built this uh, hot air balloon. It went up into the air and floated away, and they didn't plan very well, and it floated out into the countryside, um, and uh, in fact, it landed about 15 kilometers away out in the French countryside, and the peasants, who had no idea what was going on, they thought that they were being invaded by monsters, and they attacked it with pitchforks out there. They were like the, the flat earthers of their day. Um, but, uh, but just a couple months later, um, Etienne, that guy on the right, got into one of these things. They actually sent up a test vehicle with a sheep and a rooster and a duck in it. Sounds like a joke, but it's true. Um, they figured the, uh, the duck or the sheep was sort of like a human analog. They're sort of like us. And the, uh, the duck was, was, a, was a control because they can actually fly and the rooster can't fly. So they, they figured if the three of them make it, we could launch Etienne. And he launched and he survived. And we moved into the third dimension for the first time, 1783. And then uh, we finally got faster than uh, the horse in uh, 1829 with this first rocket. What a crazy looking thing, but it could go 50 kilometers an hour. And just a few years later, we're up that thing going 130 kilometers an hour across the British Midlands, just nuts. Um, and then just uh, eight years after uh, Orville and Wilbur, we were faster than the Bristol and Exeter 44. This little thing went so fast it ripped its sign off, but 133 kilometers an hour. And it didn't take very long after that to have our speed of exploration continue to accelerate. Um, and Chuck Yeager down at Edwards pushed through the speed of sound in 47. And then just 14 years after Yeager, uh, Vostok launched from the same place that Anusha and L.A. and myself, the same launch pad down at, at Baikonur um, with uh, Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin launched. And, uh, and he went once around the world. Total flight for him was 105 minutes. Um, came floating down, out of, or came blasting through the atmosphere, all sorts of problems with his spaceship, actually ejected out of his spaceship up around 20,000 feet. It crashed or s slammed down into the Kazakh steppe, and he came floating down in a parachute. But suddenly we were now away. We were into space uh, in 61. And then these guys just eight years later, of course, uh, went to the moon. They took us up to 40,000 kilometers an hour in order to be able to get to the moon. And we've been going faster and faster since, uh, in order to get out beyond Pluto, New Horizons had to go up to almost 60,000 kilometers an hour, and of course just went by Ultima Thule. And then the fastest thing that Homo sapiens have ever built is currently on its way using um, swinging between Earth and Venus to pick up speed, and the Parker Solar Probe is going to get up to 700,000 kilometers an hour so that it can get down to just a couple million miles above the sun and try and teach us about the sun itself. That, that relentless pace of acceleration. But is it fast enough? If you look at our galaxy, it's about uh, 200 million light years across. Just our galaxy with our 400 billion stars and therefore at least 400 billion planets. So even if we could, uh, I don't know, hard, like mix matter and antimatter in a dilithium crystal or something and, and get going super fast, is that even fast enough to be able to explore our, so our galaxy? And if you remember when we were flying this thing around on TV when I was a kid, the, if, when they were just sort of cruising, you know, warp one. Warp one's nothing. Warp one is the speed of light. Uh, but warp two is like uh, the, the cube of the number. So warp two is two times two times two. So it's eight times the speed of light. And whenever Kirk was just sort of normal, he'd be like, warp whatever, warp five, Scotty. And that's five times, that's 125 times the speed of light. But if they really push that thing, right, where Scotty would be all irritated and, um, and got up to warp nine, warp nine, as fast as we could go with this imaginary ship, which is uh, 81, 729 times the speed of light. 729 times the speed of light, it takes 245 years just to cross our galaxy. Five-year mission, they didn't go anywhere. They were just driving around the neighborhood, you know? <laughs> so maybe, maybe what we need is better leadership, you know, like you need a really good uh, space commander. Um, but, uh, but what we actually need, of course, 
is the relentless product of this place. We need to push the level of invention beyond where we've ever had it. Maybe the idea will be somewhere in, in the 94% of the universe we don't even understand. But we have to keep pushing the edges if we want to continue to improve the quality of life. Um, and, and there's some pretty cool stuff happening here on Earth, fortunately. And just within our solar system, there's still tremendous opportunity until we can figure out how to crack the distance like this. Lift off of the Falcon 9. Stage one prop is nominal. Stage one is transonic. Stage one landing range startup. Stage one landing leg deployed. Falcon 9 has landed. There's a Falcon line launching in uh, an hour and 10 minutes that's going to be taking a big Canadian payload up uh, out at Vandenberg. That's an amazing new caravel. It's an amazing new wheel and buggy. It's, it's revolutionized the opportunity. And the 400 billion liters of water that we've recently discovered on the moon also is a tremendous discovery uh, at the South Pole and the North Pole on the right, everywhere there's blue. There is suddenly a... a leapfrog of technology that opens up an opportunity to expand and improve the quality of life. Uh, and th that's what's happening right now. Um, and it, it'll, I don't know, that's a crazy diagram, but it'll maybe look something like that. Um, but that's the threshold of what we're on right now. It's why we're pushing all of these streams at CDL. It's very much the underpinning to why I've been involved in the space stream here. Uh, I think this is the moment in history where our third dimension technology is really opening up some new markets to do stuff that we wouldn't have even considered recently. And I mean, one of the streams is even looking at how to build these uh, 3D printed pressure vessels on other planets like this one, nice drawing for Mars. But, but that idea, you need it. You need to inspire people. You got to take the crazy ones who are willing to jump off the roof holding a handkerchief and enable them to turn those ideas into reality. And the greatest exploration engine that we've ever had, uh, where, uh, what'd you say, imagination is more important than knowledge, um, is the 1.3 kilograms that's between every one of our ears. And that's what we're here for. Our bodies are just the, the, uh, the transportation mechanism for our minds. They brought us all together for two days to try and compare all those ideas, to try and pick out of this which of these crazy ideas has the greatest opportunity to scale to the point where it can improve the quality of life for as many people as possible. That's your quest for the next couple of days, and I've been really looking forward to it. Thanks.